You notice something unusual about this scene? What, what is odd about this scene? Holy cow. This is a deep question. It's not a quiz question. It's not hard to solve. Look where we are. We're at this most spectacular view overlooking this incredible lake and these mountains, and yet, strangely, we're pointed in the direction of the lavatory. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what your view is. Mine's a three okay. butt ugly cameraman you and a are fucking bathroom. Amazing. I thought about it when I came, but then I thought, okay, obviously we want to show the beauty of the back. I agree with you. Let's saddle up. All right, you then. ready to uh, pull out, so to speak? <laughs> I'm brimming with content. <laughs> so I'm ready anytime. Parts unknown, I mean, the title expresses the intention of the show. Unknown, the unknown, and new. I don't know what Parts Unknown was. Parts Unknown was... Ugh, fuck. I can tell you what it wasn't. It's hard to say because it certainly wasn't, in my mind, a food show. Yeah, sure. We'll sit at a table and we'll have a meal. But really, it's about culture, politics. Comedy, action movie. Geography, history. It wasn't a travel show. Adventure, horror. You know, I, I don't know. It, it's hard for me to say what parts of Known was because I was so immersed in it that it was, I mean, it was definitely more than the job. It was like such an incredible experience. What is Parts Unknown is actually a really easy question because it was Tony. Oh, yeah. That is, can I say too messant on uh, CNN? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can. I've often been asked the question, what was Tony like? I feel like it's the first question everyone asks. What you saw on screen, it was and is that man. That was the magic of Tony, I think, is that people who never even met him, they would feel like they would know him. He was this curmudgeonly funny dude. He said something like, if you can't smoke in a recording studio, what the fuck has this world come to? Candid, raw. Difficult, funny, brilliant. He was honest, brutally at times. Is he nice? He's not nice, but that's okay. Even though you, you felt like he maybe liked you and liked what you were doing, you were very, very, very rarely ever gonna hear it. Did Tony say thank you? For what? I remember an event in Lyon. It was Tony, Daniel Boulou, and uh, Bill Buford. And we had gone in and pre-lit everything to seamlessly move from place to place. And Tony notices the light that is on over their head, that it's clearly not a restaurant light, but one of our lights. Oh, now he's yeah. lit already. And Bill's like, man, like your crew's like pretty awesome. You have an amazing team. And I could hear Tony say, only pet the baby when he's sleeping. As we say in the kitchen. Only. Pet the baby when it's sleeping. Only pet the baby when it's sleeping. So uh, you'll ruin him. <laughs> he was a great motivator in that way. Only pet the baby when it's sleeping. I should do more of that. Okay. All right. Say when. Good. I'm sure I did not write this line. His soul was the soul of a writer, and I think he was a beautiful writer, and I think that kind of, you know, poetry and his, his love came out through his words. Next time you turn off a news cycle filled with shouting bobbleheads, convinced that America is devolving into a moronic inferno, questioning the greatness of your nation, maybe you should come here. Here are your Purple Mountains Majesty. I think when we really hit it right, and why I think it's timeless, it's Tony's voice. That's why people 
who responded so well to it, right? They wanted to hear what this man had to say about the world. Europeans first reached West Africa in the mid 15th century, bringing with them the usual things, an industrialized slave trade, subjugation, the rule of the many by the very few. The moment that Tony's voice actually gets into a show, all of a sudden you have a full picture. You have the full perspective of this man who has an angle. You know, he knows how to point up a story. First question would be, in your lifetime, will you be able to visit Yafa? He wanted to give a platform to people who would usually be ignored, you know, who would be forgotten. People who wouldn't have a voice otherwise. He he really gave those people an opportunity to shine. He always like joked about magical ponies and unicorns, but like he truly was. He was like a fucking unicorn. Like coming into parts unknown, the first season, there was real mandate to make it different. It was a lot of pressure. If you really want to find something new, you have to be willing to fully embrace that feeling of lost, or I don't know what I'm doing. And that's terrifying, anxiety-ridden, and also the absolute most joy you can find. When we hit CNN with Parts Unknown, the show really manifested truly into what it wanted to be. Welcome to my life. Actual content, B-roll, dick jokes, Meal scene. Did I say dick jokes? Diarrhea. Where do we come from? How does it all work? How far can we go? What are we, as sentient humans, capable of? And it's funny, man. It's not until, you know, someone's gone that you, that you really, really try to understand what made them tick. And what made Tony Bourdain tick? He talked a lot about being on the move. And I think that Tony, you know, obviously like a shark, needed to be on the move all the time. And it wasn't that he was running from something, he was always running towards something. Antarctica was a, you know, it was the last continent. Tony had, I mean, literally, I think, been to the rest of the world. There have been some very intense logistics on this show, but getting a six-person crew to the South Pole uh, was one of the hardest. Oh. Oh. Chilly. It is a long-ass way down there. You know, LAX to, like, Sydney to Christchurch to McMurdo Station to the South Pole. You know, days of travel. My face hurts. <laughs> After this massive 60-hour journey, and gets there and says, It really is the ass end of the world. And walks away. <laughs> that was worth 60 hours. Best line ever. Oh. You say that one more time, Tony? No, you're kidding me, right? Take two? We don't do take twos. <sighs> now, I want to see one of those seals fuck a penguin. <laughs> the show became a vehicle for him to um, meet some of his heroes, for him to, to kind of live out some of his own dreams, like some of his own, you know, fantasies. I've had something of a multi-decade obsession with the Congo. It's been kind of a, a personal dream, if you will, to travel the Congo River. And now, for better or worse, I get that chance. There's moments in this, this series where watching Tony truly experiencing something that's like life changing.
it was an extremely selfish show. <laughs> it was very selfish. He was really out to please himself. And in doing so, I think he pleased a big audience of people. Frankly, this TV show has become uh, an impediment to the smooth operation of this mission. We might have to terminate your command. There's this misconception that directing is actually telling someone what to say. Attempt to manipulate? Yes. Direct? No. Can we just put a little piece of green behind you? No. Like 10 seconds. You were a director on a Parts Unknown episode because you were directing everything around Tony, but you were never directing Tony. So production vehicles should not park in front of the restaurant. Let's let the motorcycles park in front of the restaurant. Did you want to be able to tell Tony, like, you know, could you just, God, could you get to this point, please? Because, you know, we really do want to get to this point. It was all freeform. It's true documentary filmmaking. I would have about 15 to 30 seconds to kind of go over the main points. Just don't say action. Don't say cut. They actually said action to me on the last shoot. They were like, action. You know, really. So everybody was like this the whole time. It was like. Probably don't look at him. There were no second takes. If it was really important, you could beg or pretend to cry. Get over it, man. We'll catch it in post. So stove piping. Have you talked about stove piping? What's the definition of stove piping? <laughs> well, very much like some of the questions you're asking. <laughs> Here's some themes. Here's some ideas you might want to talk about, Tony. So. Isn't this place da 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 da? You didn't get to do that with Tony. Hated, hated, hated it. Pretty sweet. Stove piping content now, Jerry? Is that what's happening? No, man. Is that what's happening here, Jerry? Did you come to this? I can't even trust you. If he got the sense that you were trying to sway a conversation one way or the other or get him to say something. It was a wrap. I mean, it was like, you get the dagger eyes. Or like the inevitable wides, which essentially meant that the scene's over. Go wide. Want to go wide? You want to go wide? Yeah, you go wide. You he called it. Tony just called it. Well, food was a brilliant device because interview can just feel awkward or formal. Whereas if you share a meal with somebody, it opens up so many doors. The food that we ate on the road. Yeah, sometimes we got to eat incredible things. This is the number one question I get at parties. Did you eat all the stuff that Tony ate? It was never awful. It could be weird. Skinned lamb head. Sheep balls really that good. Or innards. You may throw up a little bit in your mouth while trying to get it down, but it was never awful. I definitely did not eat <laughs> all the stuff that Tony ate. Ooh, liver sandwich. That's encouraging. I offer some to my producer, and he goes literally running. I did not eat all the weird things Tony ate. I ate a lot of things that Tony didn't want to eat. <laughs> On the rare occasion, Tony would offer us some, some treats. <laughs> Helen, do you like this stuff? There you go, Helen, come on. We were filming a scene at uh, Pojang Matcha, and they had uh, silkworm stew. She hasn't been here since she's four years old. Really? Yeah. The crew obviously meant a lot to him. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, it was a trip I won't forget, you know? We were his best friends. We were the people that were with him all the time, and we like had amazing conversations about our favorite movies. We would have a conversation about our favorite movie, and we'd try to create an episode that was based on that. So we approached each episode like a singular film. We all shared a love of film and music, 
and that stemmed from Tony. I think he drew a lot of inspiration from music. If there's anything that's comparable to the way he worked, it was punk, essentially. This is a guy who had just an incredible sort of filmic knowledge base to draw off of. Tony would give us movies or books, and uh, we would often just run with it. We all got to, like, experiment in each episode. Did we want to shoot that in a very controlled, like uh, something Coppola would have shot, or something from a 70s uh, Italian film? You know, we did this trailer for the French Alps episode, like a John Wick movie trailer. Next shot is uh, him like this going. <laughs> Why would we do it? Like on CNN, we're showing this? We did things on this show that were unbelievable. But that can get expensive. Are we talking about budgets? Next question. What's a budget? Tony had no concept of what our budgets were like. Tony budgets? Didn't, he, he didn't even know what a no, budget Tony was. Tony never thought about budgets. No. 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 It was, no. 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 Not for a no. second. How much is it? Is it? Is it expensive enough? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, the budget only stayed at a certain level, but the creative push... Was greater. It was greater. When I first started working on these shows, it was, it was essentially a, uh, a case and a half of gear per person. This has gradually changed over time. <sighs> we would carry 30 cases of equipment with us. Strangest thing I've ever expensed. I can't really talk about it. Camera bodies, lenses for said camera, monitors for the cameras. Okay, let me just see how many lines this is. You can't necessarily get a receipt for the goat you just sacrificed. Will CNN accept an endangered species receipt? Scrim gym kits, clamp adapters, oh, the magic gadget, 240 volt quick dimmer, a little pillow. Should we really be spending that much on an alpaca? I was like, well, I don't know. How much does an alpaca cost in you know this part of the world? 15 millimeter rods, 19 millimeter rods. Dana Dolly's, um, gosh, where does it end? We brought a lot of stuff to make it look pretty. I think it was really about um, trying to achieve, accomplish what he wanted. I mean, he knew that he was lucky to have this opportunity to do these things. And so we were always trying to do it within our budget. So the Miami episode, I got one note from Tony. He's like, the great beauty, watch it. The party scene in that movie is absolutely extraordinary and massive in scale. We have a certain amount of money to make the show. And that's like a high, high production value. So our, you know, immediately the mind's like, how are we gonna do this? There's a scene with a woman dancing in The Great Beauty. And so we needed to kind of articulate this idea. Mo, the burliest of our cameraman, he is like directing this like dancer who's dancing in a window. You know, she's like, beautiful long hair and she's like doing this dance and it's not quite as like exaggerated as as Mo wants so there's this shot of like Mo sort of going back into the window with with her and like flipping his not hair like you know back and like just like, like doing this whole thing I think it actually worked pretty well considering I don't know you look at that and that it's hilarious first of all but then it's like it really points at the passion right and you look at that that we actually pulled this thing off Say when, boys. We're up. Roger. Caught in a landslide. We're gonna freeze out here like rats tonight. <laughs> Tony lives on camera and off camera a magical, magical journey. And there was chaos swirling around him at all times. 
we, we lived and died with what, what can go wrong. Will go wrong? Things went wrong. They want us to stop filming right now. OK. On the one side, you have control. On the other side, you have chaos. And always between control and chaos is where the show is moving. Sometimes it collapses. Political unrest, bird flu. Then there's leptospirosis, which is an infection carried by rat urine. I mean, every shoot had things go wrong. I think it was, sh yeah, it was Shanghai. My heartbeat is like going up right now, even thinking about it. We decided to visit the tallest building in Iran. Within a minute or two, we were completely crushed by this sandstorm, obviously ruining the scene. We're all running inside. Onchocerciasis, ooh, AKA river blindness. The chance of like a government shutting me down. Earthquake, uh, train wreck. The whole building starts moving like this, pieces of the roof ripping off. Stay away from the glass. Jaundice, liver function problems, and something called man flu. We landed on the ground, and I met the fixer. She said, great to meet you guys. Also, Josh, everyone has canceled. Oh, and we got all our gear stolen. There was something about Parts Unknown, and I think it was just the nature of the show, that embraced chaos. If there wasn't this element of chaos and intensity to the shoots, then, I don't know, there just, there was some intangible energy that came from that. Without a doubt, we succeeded at the, the ability to quickly veer off plan A and, and find our way to plan F and make something of it. That's why the show was good. <laughs> All right, are you up? Are you filming? The music has started. I guess that means it's time to get all killy in this motherfucker. Borneo is another example of everything going absolutely wrong. Tony's he's supposed to dispatch this pig with a big spear. They've got a pig stuck in a wooden like box that looked like it had never been opened. And it's raining some more, and we're rolling, waiting on a pig. Oh my God, where's the pig? It's coming. Is it, is it arriving by magical package? Is it, a magic, is it arriving by unicorn? Someone translate. He's, he's wondering what the fuck's going on. Tom's on the walkie screaming, sitting next to Tony, saying, where's the pig? Where's the pig? I'm up in a totally different section of the village. And since it was in the middle of a torrential downpour, the pig escaped immediately. Oh, you're joking, right? The pig escaped. It was so intense. I don't think I've ever seen Tony look more pissed. And when he has a spear in his hand, that's not the look that you want to see. It was pretty awful, actually. But fun and awful, sort of the same thing. Where is he now? OK, copy, thank you. They caught the pig in a net, and now they're tying it up. So we'll be here very soon. That's like 15 minutes away. No, no, no. Yeah. You ever tried to drag a struggling pig down to a river? All right, travel minute right now. One, two, three. Three, one. Ah, uh, the travel minute. Travel minute. The travel minute essentially was an extra deliverable that CNN wanted. Almost like a preview of, of the show. Indonesia. New Jersey. Asturias. Japan. He would basically distill and encapsulate a place in a minute. The Scottish Islands one of the most savagely beautiful places on Earth. It was like his absolute, like the antithesis of what he was all about. He hated these. Tropical Wonderland. The beaches. Did I mention the beaches? Uh, Tony was a little hesitant. It's only a travel minute. We can't encourage them with quality. 
it promotes the show. It's, it's for us. It's not like a snap-in that nobody's ever going to see except in Romania. Here we go. Travel minute. All non-essential personnel can leave. Set up a shot. He starts talking about Uruguay. This guy comes out of the background just dragging a garbage can. I fell in love with this place. I fell in love with the first day. Tony's like, how's that? And I'm like, uh, you know. Yeah, I got it. But in the background, I got a guy dragging a trash can. Perfect. Yes. I got it. Yes. Those are the kind of production values we like, Todd. Okay. Perfect metaphor for these travel minutes. <laughs> now fuck off. Thanks. That was it. That's, that's what you've been complaining about for like an hour? Yeah. It's my integrity, man. So you phoned that in? Yeah, but I, I hey, still feel like I'm jacking off a hobo. Conventions of television making had to leave the room. And it was actually really wonderful to find ways to work around those parameters. The great thing about this series is that you're given this unbelievable support structure to take chances. Doing the same thing every week was frightening to him. And I think it was always a challenge, like, can you take this idea, which may seem shocking, and actually, you know, convey it in a very artistic way. As long as we could get it past standards and practices. The Tokyo episode is a great example of that. Yeah, I, I had no idea what tentacle porn was, so. This is the first season with CNN, and they were surprised at what we brought back. I was spitting in the mouth, <laughs> nipple clamps. You know, there were a lot of things that CNN wouldn't normally put on there. I think we didn't know kind of where the boundaries and limits were. I think CNN didn't know either. If he thought your show was were mediocre, that was the end. It was no, I think that was like the magic of the show too, is like it just pushed all of us to like do something weird. Like the Korea episode. The camera department was really given free reign. Zach and Todd decided to come up with this new camera system. So these cameras, they were very small, which you think would be great, except it had to be attached to a giant backpack. We look like the uh, Ghostbusters. At that point in time, that's all we had. But it was breakthrough for what it was. Yeah, Tony found them innovative. He was excited about how it was different. But like, you know, he made some crude jokes about it. Look, those cameras are too fucking tiny. <laughs> I don't get these cameras do not get a lot of respect. I gotta tell you right now. You really need the glove for that. No, you know what? It adds no authority to this process. Happy back here. No, I'll talk soon. Don't worry. I'm gonna have food in front of me. I think shooting wise, I always really enjoyed the solo scenes. Oh, fucking hell, that's good. The solo scene is what we would do when we ran out of good ideas. We would put him in front of food and hope he would say something amazing. But the truth is, a lot of times he just talked shit on whoever was directing. Think of all the opportunity for uh, practical jokes with the Vipers. Note to self buy Rubber Snake for Jeff. Solo scenes with Tony, they worked. It was a fantastic opportunity for Tony to just unload. I'm not suggesting there are anal glands in a chicken nugget, but. I mean, here was a guy in Tony Bourdain, the master of the monologue. Man, that guy could talk. He was just trying to make us, uh, us behind the camera laugh. He would kind of deliver a line, kind of peer, you know, over the camera to see what kind of reaction he would get. I hate mascots. You know they fart in those suits. Like, at one point, I think one of the editors said, you know, the camera's moving a lot. And I'm thinking, well, it's because I'm laughing. This guy, he would start riffing, and we would just fall <laughs> apart. It was amazing. It was as close as a glimpse as you could get to our relationship with him. Mm. 
One of the great things about going to Japan is Lawson's. We had, you know, the greatest intention to go to Lawson's and eat an egg sandwich, a little solo meal, Tony on the street, eating his his beloved egg sandwich. We don't talk about the Lawson's incident because it's an ongoing investigation. What is it exactly about this place that's got its tentacles so deep into my heart and my soul? The coup de grace. The, the golden goose of sandwiches at Lawson's is the egg salad sandwich, the fluffy egg salad sandwich. It's a masterpiece. Where are you? I know you're around here somewhere. <sighs> Wait a minute. I see potato and egg. Where's the 100% egg? Where's the egg salad? No, really. Where, are, where is the egg salad? There were no egg salads of Tony's preference. Five minutes before, there were like six egg sandwiches. To be fair, that was my responsibility. And things deteriorated quickly. Where are the egg salad sandwiches? They were in there. No, there are potato and egg salad sandwiches in there. Potato, ham, and egg. You couldn't possibly have bungled that, Oof. could you? What can you say? Sometimes we fuck up. It became, it became frantic. Eggs, I was effusively and going on and on and on about how I can live without prostitutes and heroin, but that, but that the egg salad sandwiches at Lawson, this is the one thing I can't, the, what would you call it, the raison d'etre of this scene seems to have either evaporated or possibly never existed. Josh. Yeah, I'm, I'm I understand. I mean, when you when you want an egg sandwich and you expect an egg sandwich, an egg sandwich should be there. So I get it, but it, but I don't ask a lot. But really, there's one thing I do need, Josh. One thing I need desperately, and that is uncut, hundred percent pure, fluffy pillows of love. The egg salad from Lawson. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. Well, luckily in Okinawa, there's a Lawson's on every other block. So we have a crew member. Uh, the island-wide dragnet needs to be established right away. <laughs> what is he doing? You see the score <laughs> egg salad on the street? <laughs> Prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. We're doing an egg salad scene. Is there egg salad? Look at my, look at this. Highly trained professionals fanning out across Naha in search of egg salad sandwiches. And I say good luck with that because they're amazingly popular and for a reason. There was like a harrowing and frantic run down the street to the next adjacent Lawson's to try to find the correct sandwich. Is this the egg salad? Yes. Go for Josh, go for Josh. This is a crushing, a crushing disappointment. My heart sank. My heart sank like a, like all, a stone. We all, we all felt that moment. I got faith in Josh. He's got a lot of, he, he's got a lot of, at stake here. I think that he's gonna come through. Yeah, I got a lot of faith in him too. I had a lot of faith in uh, Idi Amin and uh, President Mobutu <laughs> before they drove whole nations into the ground. Because this is a monstrous abrogation of, of, of our relationship and, and, and the trust, uh, uh, the, the, the bond of uh, friendship and professionalism that we all share. I'm not saying I'm disappointed. More like devastated. So I'm waiting for my well. man, $26 in my hand. Tony? So they stopped packaging the egg salad sandwiches in whole containers, so it's split with a tuna sandwich as well. But the egg salad is still there. They're, they're, my eggs are commingling with tuna? Yes. You, you can't actually bring outside food in there and put it on their shelves, and then we'll pretend that I'm actually finding these? Is that, was that your hideous plan? Well, it wasn't a hideous plan. OK, go do that, and then they'll never know. Fantastic. 
So we're paying two different lawsuits for the same sandwich. Oh, look. How fortunate. I'll take all three of you. <laughs> Worst scene ever. Your question about was it fun is like a really good question. Because fun is a word that like I wouldn't think about necessarily for the show. <laughs> was the job fun? Was it fun? I wouldn't call it fun. We had fun. We were deep into a run. I'm in a bar in the Philippines. And the Besiege held us for a day. Filming a cover band. 13 years later, now I'm pinching myself. Three beers deep. Does having the experience of your life and of your career like fall under the category of fun? There are moments of fun, for sure. Are there any local militias we can befriend? Is like playing kickball your definition of fun? You know what I mean? The backbending that the camera guys and the producers not that much sleep in the constant sort of like, what is Tony going to think? If that falls into the category of fun, then the answer is yes. If your definition of fun is like easy going and like everything, everyone's smiling and like having a great time and like can write home about it, then no, it wasn't fun. You know, when I think back on those early days and I do remember that the joy and the laughter and the heartache and everything that went on there, if I need to feel that again, that joy, I go back and I, if, if, when I look at the Waffle House scene. So what I love about this scene is again, that Tony is truly experiencing something new and unexpected. You know what I know? I, 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 I don't want <laughs> waffles at the Waffle House. Bullshit, man. You have to have- Waffles? First thing you have, pecan waffle. Really? You get it in many episodes, but this one in particular, that was very, very authentic Tony. You know what umami means in Japanese? Actually, literally, it means I will cure for a bite of that, <laughs> that burger. Tony had so many different sides to his personality. I mean, he could be tough, he could be a raconteur, he could also be incredibly kind, big-hearted, and emotional person, sometimes all in the same interaction, which was sort of crazy. I remember in our Philippines episode, Tony joins for a family meal. The family scenes were some of the most magical moments um, that we captured in the show. One of the most incredible ones for me was with my grandmother, a Filipino woman named Aurora Medina, who raised me. And this is, I think, the first Christmas Aurora's been back in the Philippines in 40 years. After the meal, Aurora came over to Tony and started singing Edelweiss. This is the song that she sang to uh, Eric as he was changing his diapers, I believe, you know. Edelweiss. Edelweiss, every morning I greet you. And everyone is pretty emotional. It was one of the few moments that I saw Tony, you know, start to tear up. Edelweiss. You can see, if you look closely, you can see Tony totally tearing up. He's just on the verge of crying which um, he doesn't do. Forever. Yeah, it, it was really special to see Tony that vulnerable and see Tony, you know, connecting with someone um, as beautiful and, you know, selfless as Aurora. <laughs> The show itself was like a tremendous gift. We 
We got to work with somebody who was incredibly creative, obviously, but also let us experiment. The amazing thing about it is that the challenge has never really stopped any of us. We've met these challenges. I don't want to say we've met these challenges. These challenges have, have fucking inspired us to do great things. He said to Chris and I, this show is my legacy. He said, that's why I'm so hard on you guys. You know, every show I want it to be better than the next. the adventure of a lifetime. And that's not making an excuse for his uh, dickish behavior, because he was certainly, he could certainly be a dick. But he was our dick. Should we start drinking now?